Good evening. My name is Kara Weber. I'll be talking tonight a little bit about algorithms and complexity. Um, I was interested in algorithms and wanted to talk to them some, uh, to some aspect of them in my tech talk. Uh, this topic proved to be a bit intractable, but I'm hoping to provide an introduction into some of the ways that um, computer scientists and theorists think about complexity in algorithms. So my um, my screen is showing you a fractal pattern. Um, fractals are geometrical patterns that can be broken down into smaller units, and each smaller unit is a like half size or reduced size copy of the pattern as a whole. Um, fractals are found uh, throughout nature, which we can see in this uh, nice image of a cactus, some flowers, and cauliflower, which is everyone's favorite fractal image. Um, but fractals, uh, fractal patterns can also be generated by algorithms, uh, recursive algorithms, and that's an, this is an example of that that you see on the screen now. Um, so briefly, to give an introduction to an algorithm, it's defined simply as a precise rule or set of rules specifying how to solve a problem. Algorithms are complete, they are finite, they may be exact in terms of their solution to a problem, or they may be inexact. They may be approximate. Uh, in programming, they are evaluated um, among other ways, but one important way is by their big O notation, which we are all familiar with. Um, and this, the big O um, represents the upper bound on the number of operations a function will have to produce while, when it is called. So the number of operations and how this number changes as the size of input grows gives us um, some information about how long the process is going to take to complete. Another graph, which will be familiar, um, this is a plotting of inputs, n, on this axis, little n, versus um, the number of operations to, to complete the function, um, big N, on the y-axis. Uh, constant uh, operations that remain constant even as the size of input uh, grows will give us a big N of a constant, some constant, call it one. This is an ideal scenario, but not always possible. Um, a big O of N is when the number of operations grows constantly at a constant rate um, as the input size grows. And these are less, these are the sort of big O you'd see for less complex algorithms. As they get more complex, uh, you start to move to this area of the graph, and I'll just draw your attention to these three clustered here, where you have n squared, O of n squared, this is called polynomial time, um, which is um, the, the largest factor in that time is gonna be n to some power, could be n squared, could be n cubed. Um, then in the orange next th to it, you have two to the n, this is exponential time, and then finally, factorial time. Um, and so one of the significant divisions in terms of how computer scientists think about complexity occurs in the change from polynomial time to exponential time. So more on that in a minute. But just um, to return to our fractals, I wanted to start with fractals because they're pretty, they're interesting to look at. Um, they use recursive functions, which we're familiar with. Um, but also, they represent a case that might be kind of surprising, I think, for complexity, um, which is that the patterns can look complex, but the process to construct them might not necessarily be so. So this is via Khan Academy, um, a common fractal pattern called the Sierpinski gasket. Here you see the finished products, and then they also helpfully provide a step-by-step -step of how to construct this pattern. You start with a square, you divide it into four squares, you put an x in all of this, the new subdivided squares except for the one on the bottom left. Um, and then for the squares that have x's in them, you repeat the process again, uh, removing any marks from that bottom left square. It should remain empty. You repeat this process again. Notice each time the size of the square um, is diminishing and we have more lines and a more complicated picture. Finally, we'll reach a point where we decide our dimensions are small enough, um, we don't want to subdivide anymore, and at this point, if you fill in all the squares with x's in them, you get the Sierpinski gadget. So although this pattern looks complex, you have a finite and constant number of steps for each, each iteration of the function. So um, 
if I were to posit what the O of n of that particular um, fractal function would look like, I would guess that it would be um, constant n because as if we take the number of iterations as the input, as that increases in size, um, the number of operations is just going to increase at a constant rate. So that puts it in the like not so complicated region of our graph. Um, which brings me to the more complicated region of the graph. Um, there, these terms P versus NP are ways that um, theoreticians think about complexity. P means polynomial time. That means um, a time to execute which has an upper limit marked by n to some power. NP time is anything to the left of this, anything that grows at a rate faster than that described by n to some power. Um, a more, a more um, theoretical definition of them is problems in the set P can be solved on a deterministic Turing machine, I'll explain what that is in a second, um, by an algorithm that runs in polynomial time, whereas those in the set NP can be verified. Like if you have a posited solution, you can verify it on such a machine in polynomial time, but you couldn't find the solution in polynomial time. Um, a Turing machine is named for the British mathematician um, whose first name is escaping me, Alan Turing, I think, um, who was a code breaker during World War II, actually developed the model, the conceptual model that a lot of people still use for computer before the first computer even existed. Um, he was working on breaking uh, German ciphers during World War II. Um, side note, there is a 2014 movie called The Imitation Game with Benedict Cumberbatch, and it's pretty good, and it's about uh, Turing's code breaking work during the war. It has a pretty sad ending, which reflects his um, prosecution at the hands of a moralizing state. Um, so just be warned if you watch it, but I would recommend it. Um, so NP problems can be verified, but not solved in polynomial time. They can, however, be solved in polynomial time on a non-deterministic Turing machine, which is just a concept of some kind of computer that would be able to be in different states so performing different operations at the same time, uh, which I don't think exists in real life, and maybe quantum computing, but um, that's a question for someone besides me. Um, then we have, within the class of NP problems, two further complexity labels, NP hard and NP complete. Um, as far as I can tell, the definition of NP hard means it's just as hard as any hard problem in the set NP. And NP complete shares that criterion, but also, and this is kind of interesting, there, an NP complete problem is kind of a representative problem for the set of all NP problems. The idea is if you could solve an NP complete problem, your algorithm could solve with a little bit of tweaking every other NP problem. And uh, the reason this is interesting is that a lot of internet encryption relies on NP problems remaining unsolvable in any reasonable amount of time. And so if somebody were to come up with a solution to an NP-complete problem, um, internet security would be in big trouble um, because you'd be able, whoever had that solution would be able to, with work, surely, but not, you know, crazy exponential amounts of work, um, break every other, or solve every other NP problem and therefore break a lot of um, encryption. But what if you still need a solution to an NP hard problem? So one approach is to develop an approximation algorithm. This is gonna be the case of like, good enough, gives us a working solution, may not be the best, may not be ideally optimized, but will at least get us a working solution for our problem. Um, so for the remainder of the presentation, uh, which may not be much longer, uh, I'm just gonna take a quick look at one such case where um, it's a very well studied problem called the vertex cover problem. And this is a, a, a case in which an approximation algorithm, so sort of relaxing the constraints on your ideal case, will enable the problem to be solved. Um, the vertex cover problem comes from graph theory, so it's quite convenient that Karen talked to us last week about what graphs are. Um, these slides um, that are formatted in this way are uh, from a course offered at the ONS, the Ecole Supérieure in France, um, and made available via Coursera. Um, so, um, I have references at the end of the slide, if you're interested, but I just want to make clear that this is not my work. 
So the vertex cover problem is uh, you start with a graph. Here's an example of a graph. It's defined by vertices, which are blue dots. Um, the vertices are labeled. Um, they have little letters. Um, they, they also have weights, which are the red numbers. So each, vertice, each vertex has a weight, which is, at least in this case, fairly arbitrary. The edges are the black lines. And in a vertex cover problem, you want to make sure that for each edge, like this edge CB, at least one of its endpoints ends up in your solution set of vertices. Um, the reason, if, if, if speeding along here, um, the conclusion about this problem is that it is going to be um, NP hard. And why, you might ask me, and I might tell you, well, a lot of people have studied it, and they said so, and they've proven so, and a really smart professor at the École Normale says so, so we should all agree with that. But I tried to work out one reason myself, um, which is that if this each, if we have a problem with four vertices here, right, A, B, C, D, for each vertex, you have two possible states, yes or no. If we are brute force coding through all possible configurations, we end up with two to the n possible configurations shown here. So this is a problem with only um, four vertices, and it ends up with 16 possible solution states. So this, um, if we go back to that graph earlier, 2 to the n is outside of the bounds of polynomial time. Um, again, briefly, it turns out that <laughs> if you take the word of scientists past and scientists present that this problem is NP-hard, it's only because the vertex can either be in or out of your solution set. So it's either a zero if it's out, or it's a one if it's in. Um, and uh, this integer constraint is what makes the problem unsolvable. Um, a cheesy math example of a situation where you might have no integer solution um, is the second set of equations here, or the second equation here, where there's, there's no integer solution that will satisfy this equation, but if we let uh, x be a real number instead of an integer, you can find a solution, it's just gonna be messy. Um, so long story short, that's what happens with the vertex cover problem. If you relax your condition and allow uh, your solution to be a non-integer, you allow the vertex to be kind of like partly in, partly out for the sake of solving the problem. Um, you can, in fact, find a solution. It may not be like ideally optimized, but the magic moment, and I'll just tell you this about the end, is that you round. This is what you do when you have your decimal points between zero and one for each vertex, is you round up to one for that particular vertex. If, it's, if, if it ended up with a value that was greater than or equal to 0.5, and zero otherwise. And uh, the limit on this is that it would be at most two times the cost um, of the sum you're trying to minimize, the sum for all the vertices that are included. But apparently, in like day-to-day -day working scenarios, it's usually within about 10% of an optimal solution, which doesn't seem that bad. So, so much for a very quick look at complexity and algorithms.